mental wellness, mental health stigma, suicide prevention, and Islamophobia, among others. Previously, Anissa Diab worked as a therapist at various campus counseling centers. She was also coordinator for the Stand For You Suicide Prevention Program at Salisbury University's Counseling Center. Later, she worked as a crisis counselor for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Currently, Anissa provides faith-based counseling sessions with Muslim clients worldwide at www.anissadiab.com. You can also find that link in our chat today. She's also co-host of a weekly show on Ahlul Bayt TV called Mental Health Matters and a member of the psyched for You project with Emma Mathie Association of Marjaya, which aims to support strong mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being of Muslim youth. We're so excited to have Sister Anissa Diab here today to talk about such an important topic uh, that is so relevant to Americans and American Muslims. Approximately 30 million Americans live with an eating disorder, and per the South Carolina Department of Mental Health, almost half of all Americans know somebody with an eating disorder. And we almost never hear our community leaders address this issue, let alone address it in relation to fasting during Ramadan. So with that, I'll hand it over to Sister Anissa now. Thank you so much. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum everyone and Ramadan Kareem. I'm really honored to be here and I want to thank Muhabbin Initiative for having me. Um, they're based at the Islamic Education Center in Potomac, Maryland, and I am so honored to be speaking on this topic. I've actually been waiting on a group of Muslims to come up with this topic for Ramadan because it's so important. It's not often spoken about. Um, and so when we were looking at the dates for when we were going to have this event, I said, if possible, let's have it as soon as we can so that we can help as many Muslims as possible who might be struggling with this and also as a community be able to support our Muslim brothers and sisters and, and others as well who might be struggling with an eating disorder. So having said this, um, I do want to give a trigger warning that some of the things that we may be discussing today um, could be hard for individuals, especially who might be in, in the throes and in, missed having a uh, eating disorder themselves. So please listen to your body. If you need a break from this at any point, please do so um, and take care of yourself during and after the presentation, inshallah. So for this session today, it's going to be about 30 minutes of me talking, and then towards the end, we'll leave some time for question and answer about 10 to 15 minutes. But the objectives for today are as follows. We want to develop a basic understanding of the major types of eating disorders out there and some of the warning signs that a fellow um, you know, friend or family member might be dealing with one. We wanna learn about the unique challenges that Muslims might be facing when it comes to eating disorders, especially during the month of Ramadan. And we wanna talk about ways to support our, our community members and those who are struggling, as well as coping strategies and treatment options and resources. So a lot to cover in a short period of time. Inshallah, I'll do my best to be thorough and we'll leave time for questions at the end. So sister mentioned some statistics at the beginning here, a few more facts that we know about eating disorders. In the US, more than 20% of people with eating disorders that are untreated die prematurely, either from the health consequences of the eating disorder itself or suicide. Um, we know that anorexia nervosa is the most deadly disease affecting teen girls. 30 million Americans have suffered with an eating disorder at some point during their life. And according to the National Eating Disorders Association survey, 10 million females and 1 million males struggle with bulimia or anorexia. And we know that eating disorders are definitely higher risk for athletes and especially those who are in the sports arena who have certain requirements about um, weight and appearance. Let's talk about some misconceptions. The first myth out there is that eating disorders mainly affect swags or skinny, white, affluent girls. This is not the truth. <laughs> you know, eating disorders definitely affect a wide range of individuals and they do not discriminate. It's, it's 
equally as common among Hispanics, African Americans, Asians. It doesn't discriminate on the basis of culture, religion. They affect Muslims. They affect people of all walks of life. And we know also the, the common, we've heard this in the community many a time, that having a mental illness or having an, an eating disorder is a sign of a weakness of faith, a weakness of iman. This is one of the most stigmatizing perceptions out there that prevents Muslims with eating disorders from getting the help that we need. We need to remove this rhetoric from our conversations. Having an eating disorder is not a weakness of faith. It is a test of faith. And honestly, having worked with individuals who struggled with eating disorders or their mental health, I can tell you these folks are superheroes. The things that we find so easy, getting out of bed or being able to enjoy a meal or being able to function and have healthy relationships, just basic things that we take for granted folks with eating disorders may struggle with just those basic parts of life and battling yourself, battling your own brain every day is a, a battle that I would not wish on anybody. So the fact that this person is even going, trying to get up every morning and doing their best um, to even try to see if they can fast, we've got to give these, these folks some grace. The other misconception is, you know, that we just, this person just has to eat more. Um, if they're anorexic, you know, stop starving yourself, just eat more. If, if you are struggling um, with binge eating, you know, just go on a diet. This is, this is not helpful advice, okay? Eating disorders are deep-rooted issues. It's really not about the food at the end of the day. The, it's about control issues. It's about trauma. It's about mental illness, other social factors. So telling somebody these simplistic statements is incredibly unhelpful. The other misconception we see in the Muslim community is, you know, if you cover your hair, if you wear hijab, if you dress modestly, you're not going to have body image issues because of the emphasis on one's character and one's dean rather than outward appearance. And this is also not true. You can wear hijab, you can dress modestly. And just because hijab is about focusing on the inner character and beauty doesn't mean that somebody can still not struggle with an eating disorder. The other misconception is eating disorders are just a phase or a diet gone too far. Um, this is not true. Eating disorders are a progressive disease. It gets worse over time when you do not treat it. There is also a very physical component to this disease that makes it difficult to have control over it. And the sixth misconception out there is that eating disorders aren't serious. Um, they, you know, these are not big problems compared to other mental health issues. This is not true. We know they're serious. We know anorexia actually has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric illness. So people are dying from eating disorders. We need to take them seriously. I'd like to read a couple of narratives, personal experiences that Muslims have shared about having an eating disorder during the month of Ramadan throughout this presentation. Keep in mind, these are folks who have um, given permission to share their stories, but I think it's really important to hear some of these narratives of what it's like for folks to be struggling with an ED or an eating disorder during Ramadan. So Adel Adeline Hussein, she talks about what it's like to having an, an eating disorder during Ramadan. She says, after my first day of fasting, the unfamiliar weight in my stomach triggered new thoughts. Instead of feeling relief from finally being able to eat, I decided to purge after iftar. This quickly became a pattern for me throughout Ramadan. Even long after the Eid holiday ended, my routine remained. Despite the harm I was causing my body, my eating disorder brought me comfort for all the wrong reasons. I knew I could never control the way others viewed me, but fasting allowed me to control the way I viewed myself, both within my community and in the face of American beauty standards. 
while I should have been observing Ramadan because of my faith, it was my eating disorder, not my faith that motivated me to fast. As my body grew weaker, my mind continued to give in to the triggering thoughts. I somehow had managed to convince myself this was all a sign of strength. In reality, I was losing a battle with my mental health and I felt like I couldn't talk to anyone about it. My parents never asked me if I was struggling, though they did occasionally make comments about my extreme weight loss. Mental health is not openly discussed in my community, but I wish it was. I was so ashamed, I had to keep my struggle to myself. Today, my eating disorder finally feels manageable, but every year at the start of Ramadan, I worry about relapse, which is made harder by the fact that other Muslims have looked down on me for not participating. So this is just a glimpse of what it's like to have an eating disorder in Ramadan. And what stands out to me about her story is that this is someone who not just worries about a potential relapse, but you know she feels judged by other Muslims around her for not participating. What we already know about eating disorders is folks already feel a great deal of internal shame, but to feel the community shame on top of that and the spiritual guilt is a lot of times too much for people to bear. Um, she mentions that her eating disorder was also what was motivating her to fast and not her faith. And that is a telltale sign that recovery has not happened for this person when somebody is fasting for their eating disorder and not for their creator. So that is the time to step back and get treatment. And inshallah, we'll talk about what that treatment will look like later in the presentation. Another narrative from Aza al Tiraif, she says, technically the Quran specifies that Muslims who suffer from any kind of illness are absolved from the fast, so long as they make up the lost days once they are healthy or feed less fortunate Muslims throughout the month. But culturally, illness refers to physical ailments such as diabetes and cancer, rather than depression or anorexia. Often Muslims with mental health issues also come to believe their disorders are not legitimate and they feel too guilty or ashamed not to fast. If this was cancer or diabetes, I'd be like, yeah, that's a real sickness. But because it's anorexia, I always thought, oh, it's just in my head. I should be able to overcome it in order to fast. So this is really challenging what, what as I was talking about. And you know, with, what we've got to keep in mind is that you know, there is a difference between restrictive eating, which is the eating disorder, the psychological illness, versus restricted eating, which is fasting. So what we heard from Aza's personal story is that, you know, it seems people are much more understanding if there's a physical component, somebody has cancer, somebody's, you know, sees a physical illness that someone's going through, but it's almost like mental pathology just is not recognized within the Muslim community. And we have to change this mindset as a community. Mental illness is a real illness. And the brain is an organ like any other brain in the body, and it is susceptible to disease, okay? What we also need to keep in mind is that most people with eating disorders don't just have an eating disorder and that's it. Most people with eating disorders also struggle with, a dep with depression at the same time or anxiety or OCD, or they have some other kind of trauma that is causing, that is co-occurring with the eating disorder. So there's a lot that has to be treated, not just the eating disorder itself, but also the other co-occurring diagnosis. Ramadan is also a really challenging time for someone with an eating disorder because your sleep is compromised, your nutrition is compromised. Um, with waking up early, with the late night prayers, and then not being able to take medications during the day, um, it really can mess with a person's mind. The other um, 
you know, it's, it's interesting because we actually see this highlighted in many different studies. So there was a study published by the Journal of World Psychiatry that found that 45% of Muslims with bipolar disorder had suffered either manic or depressive symptoms during Ramadan. So it's a time for relapse for many individuals. In the Holy Quran, we know that we are instructed to ask the people of knowledge, you know, to ask the Ahl al-Dhikr. So let's see, what do experts, you know, say about how to deal with fasting during the month of Ramadan if you have an eating disorder? We hear from Dr. Farha Bessi. She is um, an assistant psychiatry professor at Michigan State University. She's also founder of the Muslim Mental Health Conference that has been ongoing for over 20 years. She's one of the pioneers in Muslim mental health. She says no Muslim with anorexia or bulimia should observe the fast. We find studies done in Turkey, for instance, where during the, the past two years, they noticed an increase in patients with disordered eating patterns during or shortly after Ramadan. They found that, you know, especially with adolescents, there, that drastic change in one's diet that occurs can exacerbate an existing eating pathology. We hear from Dr. Rania Awad as well. She is director of the Muslim Mental Health Lab at Stanford University and a psychiatrist. And she makes a very interesting point. She says, without a holistic treatment plan, patients are either fasting when they shouldn't be, not taking their medications without telling their healthcare provider, or they are potentially not taking part in Ramadan when they can be. So that leads us to the question, can you fast with an eating disorder during the month of Ramadan? Okay, we know that Ramadan is a very spiritual and communal month, right? It's a, it's a time where, you know, this is a support system for many people. So it is hard, you know, people, I gotta be honest with you, I've never met somebody with a mental health issue who is just trying to get out of not fasting. Most people want to fast. They want to be a part of the month. They want to feel like they're part of the broader community, right? So we've got to validate how hard this is to make this kind of decision. But in terms of making the decision, you first need to make sure, sure that you have a good care team in place, okay? When you're struggling with an eating disorder, this is not just about finding a therapist and that's it, no. You've got to have your physician, you've got to have a, a psychiatrist and or a therapist involved, you've got to have a dietitian involved, um, you need a care team when you're dealing with an eating disorder, okay, and what you want to make sure is that your physician, your care team understands what fasting actually entails, okay, you don't want a physician who uh, is just going to furrow their brows the minute you bring up fasting and not try to understand what's involved and just immediately advise not to fast. Okay. You want somebody who's going to be spiritually sensitive. Um, so make sure that you have that person in your care team, your physician, your, your therapist, they should all understand what fasting is all about. And you want to consider arranging a consultation between your providers uh, or at least one of them and a, a local imam or a faith leader who you believe is a mental health ally um, so that they can consult as well with potential ways to make Ramadan work for you. The bottom line is your ability to fast depends on your place and your recovery. Okay, so if you are a Muslim with an eating disorder and you are actively purging, you are actively restricting and starving, um, this is not the time to participate in Ramadan. You need to make sure that those things are under control before being able to try again with fasting. And even once those things are under control, it has to really be under close supervision with your care team. And please, if you know, if your if your care team is advising you not to do it, it doesn't matter what a scholar says in the community, 
you need to follow your care team because that scholar is that religious leader scholar is probably not aware of all the intricacies of your situation. Another narrative here, um, Tanvir Salahuddin, a 29 year old who struggles with bipolar disorder and attention hyperactivity deficit disorder, plunged into a two week depressive episode during Ramadan. He was taking the five medications that help him regulate his mental health after sunset, which made him so exhausted during the day that he skipped his summer college classes and he could barely get out of bed. He began to have suicidal thoughts, but when Salahuddin asked his imam whether it was okay to stop fasting given his symptoms, the religious leader from Egypt responded that it would be kind of like a cop out. Oh, okay, not fasting does not make you a bad person. You are not any less of a Muslim if you cannot fast during the month of Ramadan. It makes you a good person when you take care of the amana, amana, this body that Allah has given you and you look after it. And that should be respected by family members. It should be respected by Muslim community at large. The way this Imam responded um, is very harmful to members of the community. It's not the first time I've heard stories like this and we've got to empathize. You know, I, the reason I share these stories, I want us to empathize what this must be like to take five medications all at once after sunset when you have a severe mental health disorder like bipolar disorder. I mean, that's not a joke. Somebody like that cannot forego these medications, not to mention he's high risk for suicide. So we have to, yes, work as a team with our imams, with our religious leaders, but please be aware that sometimes people can be ignorant about mental health issues. And if you get an answer like this, that, you know, you're copping out, um, you know, you've got to find another, you know, person who is a, a, a mental health ally in the community who is a, a religious scholar to talk to for sure. Another narrative I learned from the Quran that fasting during Ramadan has some exceptions for children, elderly, pregnant women, women during their menstrual periods and the ill. I already have observed children and elderly fast. So why did they continue to participate? Also, what qualifies as ill? When I asked my parents, they told me ill are those who have cancer, diabetes, or were told by their doctors not to engage in Ramadan and fasting. Yet my father who has type two diabetes continues to maintain his fast throughout the month of Ramadan despite his illness. Why? After all, he is the exception according to the Quran, right? I learned that if he didn't participate in Ramadan, the Muslim community would judge him he would be seen as weak for not fasting because of his illness. And if he fasts with an illness, others would respect his ability to put his faith first over everything else. Everything is really straightforward. That's what I love about Islam. When you open up the Quran, you go to Surah Baqarah, verse 125, verse 185, it says the month of Ramadan is that in which was revealed the Quran, a guidance for the people and clear proofs of guidance and a criterion. So whoever cites the new moon of the month, let him fast it. And whoever is ill, we're on a journey than an equal number of other days. Allah intends for you ease and does not intend for you hardship and wants for you to complete the period and to glorify Allah for that to which he has guided you and perhaps that you will be grateful. We forget Islam is a simple religion. It's not meant to be burdensome. It's meant to be a source of peace. And it's very sad that even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made these exemptions clear for people in the Quran with chronic illnesses or other issues, it's like we cannot give these people grace to take those exemptions. Even without those mental health issues, we see this even with you know, moms who are pregnant or nursing, there's a cultural pressure to still fast or you know what, give your baby formula. You know, Islam is simple. Let's not make like what is halal for ourselves haram for ourselves. The answer is clear. 
So I want to talk a little bit. I'm going to you know, go through these quickly, but I just want to make sure everybody kind of has a basic understanding of the main eating disorders and the symptoms and the signs. But the first major one most of us have heard about is anorexia nervosa. So with anorexia nervosa, people see themselves as overweight when they are clearly very underweight, okay? Eating food, weight control, it all becomes an, ex an obsession. Um, they count their food carefully. They count their calories. They're, um, you know, they have this distorted body image. It's just an unwillingness to maintain a healthy weight. And what's so challenging about anorexia nervosa is during Ramadan, you know, Muslims are expected to use discipline to ignore their hunger. And that is the same mentality that fuels anorexia, which is what makes it so hard not to relapse for somebody with anorexia during the month of Ramadan. Some of the symptoms to look out for in a friend or family member who might have anorexia are um, thinning of the bones, um, brittle, dry hair, nails, yellowing skin. Um, they're going to have low blood pressure, difficulty breathing. There's growth of fine hair all over their body called lanugo that can possibly manifest uh, severe constipation. As it gets worse, there's brain damage that occurs, lethargy, chronic fatigue, and even infertility. Reading another narrative here, Andlib Jelani is a 33-year-old who until recently struggled with bulimia, says she would often throw up after suhoor and had a tendency to overindulge in fried foods such as samosas and pakoras when she broke her fast at night. Sometimes I noticed I was eating more than others, says Jelani, who a few years ago dropped from a size six to a zero and also struggles with depression but I thought of it as a weight loss month too. I would tell myself, remember, we're losing weight all at the same time. So this is a good example of someone going through bulimia nervosa during Ramadan, eating large amounts and then purging or throwing up. Um, interestingly, she, you know, Andalib felt a sense of comfort in losing weight with other people at the same time, which again is, is not the right kind of comfort a person should be feeling. This indicates the person is fasting for the wrong reason. They are not in the right place in their recovery journey too fast. With bulimia, there's frequent episodes several times a week or even several times throughout the day of eating unusually large amount of foods and then and then you, you purge that later on. Um, this purging behavior could be vomiting, it could be using laxatives or diuretics, um, or even excessive ex exercising. This could also all be done in combination. So the difference with somebody with anorexia is that people who have bulimia actually tend to maintain what is considered a normal or healthy weight. So it can be a little bit more difficult to determine um, just by looking at them if there is a problem, but they still have that fear of gaining weight and they want to desperately lose that weight. Signs of bulimia are chronically inflamed sore throat, swollen salivary glands, the tooth enamel unfortunately gets decayed, gets worn off from all the vomiting and the acid that comes up. Um, as you can imagine, this causes acid reflux issues and severe hydration with anybody that's going to be vomiting a lot. And of course, an electrolyte imbalance. Binge eating disorder is the last major um, eating disorder I'm gonna go through with you. And with this eating disorder, it's a little bit hard for people to understand. Sometimes it was actually just recently added to the DSM-5 manual, which is the, the manual that clinicians use to diagnose mental disorders. Um, it was recently added in its own category. It's more than just overeating and losing control over eating, um, you know, like a bag of chips accidentally when you're watching TV or having a second slice of, of apple pie. This is overeating at a problematic level where a person has completely lost control. It is interfering with their, their life. Um, you know, they may be eating a lot in secret, um, binging in secret. They may avoid social events to be able to stay home and binge 
on their favorite foods, even when they are full and uncomfortably full, they will continue to binge. There is no purging involved. There is no vomiting involved. So as you can imagine, folks like this struggle a great deal with obesity. Other less common eating disorders, which just gonna briefly touch on, there's pika, which is eating things that are not considered food, like dirt, cloth, hair, pebbles. Um, this tends to be manifested in folks who are um, struggling with a mental disability. Um, we see this a lot in children and women who are pregnant. A lot of times it's indicative of some kind of um, malnutrition. There's some nutrients in the body that are not being received um, and it's, it's pretty treatable. There is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Um, this, these folks, they have just a complete lack of, of interest in food um, or they have an intense um, distaste for how certain textures are, smells or looks are of food. There's purging disorder, which is you know just purging constantly using laxatives, excessive exercising to control the weight gain, um, but they do not binge on the eating. They are not overeating foods. There's nighttime eating disorder. Um, individuals frequently will wake up in the middle of the night and just eat right after awakening from sleep, um, typically and tends to be at nighttime as the syndrome indicates. So one, one, many of you might be wondering what causes eating disorders, like why do people develop this? Um, and I think with eating disorders, there are a lot of myths out there, a lot of negative stereotypes about the causation. A lot of times our culture tends to blame it on oversimplified um, explanations like media's promotion of, you know, very slender models or even bad parenting, but it's, it's a much more complicated issue. Research is showing it's very multifaceted. There is no one sig single cause. It is highly correlated with low self-esteem, with feeling hopeless, with um, feelings of inadequacy or perfectionism. It tends to be something that people have found is has a genetic component to it. They've done a lot of twin studies on this and found that even twins not living in the same household, the same environment, the other twin has a 40% um, likelihood of also developing an eating disorder. Um, so there's very much a ge genetic component to it, but it is um, usually a combination of genetics, so social factors, um, it can be environmental in the home as well. And in addition, we talked about uh, mood disorders and anxiety disorders playing a role in, in causation as well. So how do we, you know, tell some signs of a friend or a loved one um, if they might be struggling with an eating disorder? Well, you know, if you've got a friend or family member who's talking a lot about weight and food, every time you meet with them, they're talking about um, just how they're counting their calories or the next diet that they're on or talking about excessive exercising. You know, I was at the gym for three hours today and I can't, I'm going to be there for three hours tomorrow and three, you know, that's, that's definitely a red flag. Um, if you see somebody that is just seems to be avoiding, um, spending time with you on the, at the dinner table or just ref, not, not really, you know, engaging with you um, in terms of wanting to meet up over lunch or food, that can be a red flag. Um, if you see somebody suddenly wearing very big baggy clothing, that can be hiding, um, trying to hide their body shape. So that can be a component as well. Um, you know, if they're competing a lot about how little or how much, um, you know, they've eaten, that can be a sign as well. Another big one, I think, is if somebody is going to the bathroom right after a meal and you're hearing noises that sound like vomiting, um, that's, that's a big sign. Uh, if you see somebody gaining a lot of weight and you're not even seeing them eating, um, that can be a sign of binge eating behavior. Very defensive. Yes, people with eating disorders, if you confront them about it, if you try to talk to them about it, a lot of times they're going to be very defensive and sensitive and angry about it. Um, so that can be 
a warning sign. And yeah, if you see this person is complaining about being cold a lot, or they have a tendency to bruise easily, um, they're buying supplements, they're taking pills to lose weight, this can all be indicative of a body image issue. So how can you help? The first thing you wanna do is you wanna to talk to them privately about what you've noticed. Um, just use I statements and explore with them um, how you can help you know, just the, how can you help make their life better? Um, learn about as much as you can about eating disorders from reliable resources, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And just try not to be too watchful um, of their eating habits and judgmental of it. You know, you've got to know your limits with this. It's really tempting, again, to tell your friend you need to eat more, um, but a lot of times you're just going to think you're judging them and not even want to eat with you. So try to talk to them about things other than food, focus on their inner qualities, the positive things about them and offer to go with them. Um, you know, if they've never been to a counseling session or a support group before, offer to go with them and, and see, um, how you can help with, with at least getting them in moving in the right direction and just remind them that, you're there for them um, no matter what. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time because I'm, I'm, I know we're coming towards the end of this, but um, if you are somebody who has an eating disorder and you're trying to cope during Ramadan, um, the main thing is to decentralize the food plate and, and just focus on your self-development, okay? Whether you can fast from food or not, you know, just make it your intention to prioritize um, the parts of your character, the parts of your iman that you can focus on, um, you know, focus on prayer, focus on Quran, focus on um, gathering intentionally with others and volunteering, raising money for charitable organizations. Ramadan is so much more than just about fasting. Um, it's a month of Quran. It's a month of connecting with the creator. So make this a month that decentralizes food focuses on stead and on how you're going to walk away from this month as a better person and the best version of yourself. You want to be mindful around social media, take a lot of breaks. If there's anything that's, you know, triggering you um, in terms of images um, or, you know, photos that have disordered eating behaviors, you know, take a break from a month and, and at least see after that month how you feel and consider taking those media breaks as often as you need. Um, and the th first step is just to talk to somebody. It's amazing how many people keep this secret um, for themselves. Just start by talking, talking to anybody, a friend, um, a loved one that you, that you know is gonna be understanding and, and wanna help you. And then get that professional help. Make this a month where you reach out to the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put on this earth, the professionals, to help you get through this and make that your focus and just harness that power of dua and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to find the opening that you need to get out of this situation, inshallah, so that next Ramadan you'll be able to, to find the support um, and be able to, inshallah, participate in Ramadan if you can. So again, wrapping up here, um, treatment, we talked earlier about having a, a, a care team in place. Um, the first form of treatment is residential treatment, um, three to six months of that, followed by step-down treatment of intensive outpatient care. This is very difficult for many people. Um, it's a big investment of time. A lot of times it can get... Um, difficult financially to do this. So if you can do this, it's ideal. If you cannot, the next best step is to go to as many support group meetings as you possibly can, because those are free. Um, so go to eating disorder support groups, go to eating disorder anonymous meetings. Um, of course, you know, sometimes you need more than meetings. If somebody is severely um, you know, at a point of severity in their, their um, anorexia, for example, they may need to just go straight to the hospital and get that, that inpatient care. So like we talked about, always talk to your doctor, be under the supervision of your care team about the next steps that are, are needed for you. 
Um, psychotherapy, very helpful. There is CBTE, so cognitive behavioral therapy specifically designed for eating disorders. The Maudsley approach has also been found to be helpful um, in particular for adolescents struggling with eating disorders. It engages the family in, in taking part and in, in really helping um, the child recover and, it, and it allows the parents to take an active role in their um, ability to inshallah recover from that eating disorder get a dietitian, consider nutritional counseling, and of course, medications may also be a part of this as well. Just wrapping up, here are the last, um, you know, final resources I wanted to give here. I'll leave it up on the screen um, for you if you want to, you know, take a picture with your phone, and inshallah, this is all being recorded, so you'll be able to access it later. But these um, are helplines. These are, um, Khalil Center is a national resource for Muslims here in the U.S. where it can help you, it helps you find a mental health provider in your state. Um, so if you're struggling with an eating disorder, it's wonderful if you can find a Muslim provider who understands Ramadan, who understands fasting, all the challenges that are entailed with having an eating disorder as a Muslim. Um, there's a, a directory, SEMA, Muslim Mental Health Directory, that's also helpful, inshallah. So without further ado, this is my information. If anybody wants to reach out, um, my website is there and um, we'll open it to, to Q&A, inshallah, now. Thank you so much, Sister Anissa. Uh, this, this topic is, it's so necessary to talk about this and we, we just never hear about it in the Muslim community. And I think it's also specifically so important for the Muslim community to recognize that the mental health disorders that affect Americans in general, like we're not exempt from that. We are Americans, we suffer from the same issues. Exactly. Um, I also really appreciated that you went over the signs of eating disorders, because I think in some cases it can be really easy to be in denial about it, especially if you have something like exercise bulimia or um, interacting mm -hmm. with extreme exercise, because there's not a huge stigma associated with working out a lot. And also very important that you mentioned um, about purging with laxatives because people who vomit to purge you, is sometimes easy to catch them and confront them about that and hopefully in not a extremely confrontational but a safe way. But people who use laxatives, it's so much harder to tell that something is going on. It's so much easier for them to hide, even especially from friends, but even from their own family when they're in the house with them. Um, mm -hmm. But this is just so necessary and we really appreciate you being here. I'm gonna, uh, the, so we're opening the floor for questions. Feel free to post anything in the chat. If you feel uncomfortable posting it with your own name, you can post it anonymously or you can uh, message me or Sister Anissa, uh, DM us privately in the group chat. Um, let me read one of the comments here. Sister Tanja Kubica mentioned that uh, joining from Melbourne, Australia, that she has a 15-year-old daughter with anorexia nervosa who didn't fast last Ramadan, but her weight has been restored now, and she wants to fast this Ramadan, and she's constantly concerned about her daughter's possible relapse. Yeah, that is so hard, and I'm glad that she took that break that she needed, and again, it's really it has to be you know, every year you have to go through this, this stage where you really assess for your child, for knowing their situation and what they're going through and taking the doctor's advice and the care team's advice, you know, what are the best steps? And I think those first couple of days that you really have to closely monitor your child and have conversations about how are you feeling? Um, how is this going for you so far? Like, are you, are you having any familiar feelings um, from when you were struggling with anorexia before? Do you feel like you're doing, you able to do this for your creator? Or is it, are those feelings arising of, um, you know, doing this for your disorder? We heard that so many times in those different narratives where it was hard to separate those two things. So it's just, it is, you do have to, as a parent, keep that in mind every year that your child can potentially relapse and just, you know, follow the, I, I say, follow your, your caretakers, your, your, your mental health providers, your doctors, your um, nutritionists advice on the matter and just weigh the pros and cons and, 
inshallah, I wish the best for her. And I pray that she is able to make a full recovery in her journey, inshallah. We have uh, another question. I think this one is really, uh, really relevant. What do you recommend for observing Ramadan in relation to fasting for those who may not fall under the traditional definition or criteria of an eating disorder like anorexia or bulimia, but experience disordered eating habits as a result of other mental health issues like anxiety, depression, PTSD, or even if they don't have another diagnosed mental health condition? Because um, I know you, you mentioned before there's a within the Muslim community, community, obviously, there's a big stigma about not fasting during Ramadan even sometimes when you have a physical illness, people seem to put a stigma on people who have diabetes and don't fast or who are pregnant and don't fast. Mm -hmm. um, so it becomes really difficult for somebody who doesn't have a diagnosed condition but has mm -hmm. disordered behaviors to determine if it's the right choice for them to fast or not. Mm -hmm. I think you have to ask yourself, is my disordered eating impacting my functioning and impacting my relationships? And once it starts to impact those two things, that's a sign that this is getting out of hand. Um, again, like eating disorders, a lot of times it's about the feeling it's a, it's a control battle, you know, using either using food as a form of control when you feel things are out of control or you know, like we see with folks who, who are binge eating, you know, trying to lose all control, like just it's a form of stress relief to eat and just let go of that control through binging. So everybody knows their own capacity. I want to emphasize that, that we don't know what somebody else is going through. And, you know, I, may, I forgot to make this point earlier, but there might be somebody with disordered eating or an eating disorder who is able to fast there, you know, maybe their symptoms are a little bit milder. They're showing some signs of disordered eating, but they're not in an active stage with the disorder where they do not have control over this, those symptoms. So um, while one person who has suffered with an eating disorder may be able to fast, you know, that doesn't mean that you should be able to fast too. You've got to be careful not to compare yourself to somebody else who has depression and might be fasting or somebody else who um, might be struggling with a mental illness and could be fasting. But I would say trust your instincts on this too. I think Allah has given us all this fitra, this gut instinct that we have to know our capacity and what we can handle and what somebody else may be able to handle, we may not be able to handle. And Allah doesn't want to place a burden on ourselves more than we can bear. So I would say for this person, just monitor that. And if it's getting more severe, concerning, and you feel like the fasting is not no longer you know, the right Nia, the right intention isn't in place. It's now becoming more about your disorder than about your faith. And maybe it's, it's time to talk to your doctor about that or talk, to, make a, an appointment with a therapist if you don't have one to, to really process that. So we have a question from Sophie Ahmed. Uh, would you recommend that individuals make up their fasting days at a later point when they are recovered, the same way someone traveling during the month would make up the days after Ramadan is over? You want to ask, definitely, that's a question for your scholars. Like you want to, this is where I think your spiritual team member comes into play, where you, this is, we want their guidance. You know, I think that imams, our, our scholars, our shuyukh, they play an important role in helping us understand um, how, what, how we can move forward from this. My understanding is that if you can make it up at a later date, you know, that it's recommended to do that, but also it depends how many years, you know, you have gone without being able to fast. So I think there are some exemptions where if it's been a certain number of, of years, like you're not expected to do all of those, you know, years, but you know, this is, this is one of those questions you should ask your, your spiritual guide with for sure and get the answers with that. Inshallah. I had a question Jen, that came up during the presentation. Um, so as everybody here knows, I feel like there's not a single Muslim woman who hasn't experienced a typically a man inappropriately asking you why you're not fasting during Ramadan. 
and that's for like the most basic things like you're on your period you shouldn't have to explain that to a grown man but people do ask those nosy questions and what do you do when you have made the decision for your mental health to not fast for your mental and physiological health that you can't do this but that's also a private some people consider that a private thing. They don't want to expose their uh, their condition to the world. What should they do in the case that they're asked that and they don't want to reveal themselves, but they also don't want to come off looking, um, I don't know, like, I guess, suspicious. Like, you, you don't want to seem like, oh, there's there's more going on. Like, there's a more serious condition than even what you thought it was. It's, it's sad, isn't it, that people actually ask that question. Um, <sighs> It's, it's very bad akhlaq. And I hope everybody's listening today. Well, you know, again, we're about being stigma fighters here. And I think um, that is just a question that's so unnecessary. Honestly, if somebody asked me that, I think I would throw back a question at them and just say, what's your intention in asking me this? What's your intention in asking me that? And just see what they say. You know, if they say, oh, I'm just curious say, well, you know, this is my, my relationship with Allah is something that is between me and him. And I have my reasons, but that's my story to share. And I'd rather, you know, keep that between myself and Allah, you know, you're familiar. There are a lot of exemptions, you know, for fasting in the Quran. So, um, you know, this is, you know, something that I would rather keep private to myself, you know, I, you know, we don't have to answer every question that people throw at us in life. I think we feel, we feel obligated. We feel like we're being disrespectful, but I think it's okay to say, you know, I'd rather not answer that. Thank you. (laughs) You know, it's not, I, and I think, yeah, I, I think letting people know that in some way, if you can indirectly let that person know, like, through somebody, even a third party, you don't want to make a scene. It depends on the context of when this is happening. But I think people like that kind of need that wake up call that, Hey bro, you can't be asking that sister, you know, why she, why she's not fasting. It's just bad. akhlaq. Like what you want her to say she's on her period or like, you know, what do you want her to, what do you expect? Um, so yeah, it's... I like that response. That's basically a nice way of saying it's not your business. But I think for for the people who are shy and were raised to like answer when somebody asks them something and like are in the moment, I feel like it is a. You mentioned another thing, like it is a great the easy thing to say to be prepared to say is there's lots of reasons in the Quran that exempt mm-hmm. you from fasting. Yeah, and, you and you, it, if and if yeah, and if you feel like you lose those words in the moment, it's also okay to excuse yourself and say oh my god excuse me I've really got to go to the restroom (laughs) I really got like oh my god excuse me I really got to take this important call right now you you don't don't put yourself in an uncomfortable situation things you know our story is you know not it's not for the world to know there are things about ourselves that not everybody gets access to just because they ask the question so (laughs) I'll take uh one last question here um so really important I think We know your answer to it, but for the benefit of this viewer, is it recommended to try fasting if you worry about relapse? Family members have suggested this, but I don't think they understand how it could potentially cause relapse. But at the same time, it makes me question, am I just looking for an excuse to not fast? Mm -hmm. Well, you're definitely not looking for an excuse to not fast. If If you're asking this question, it tells me like you do want to, you want to be a part of this month. And again, it depends on where you are in your healing journey. And I recommend that if you want to try, again, you do it under close supervision of your care team. And you know what, try before Ramadan begins without the pressure of Ramadan. You know, if you know you want to try the upcoming Ramadan, then do try half a day and see how that feels, you know, do like Uh, don't you don't have to do it day one of Ramadan prepare yourself a little bit ahead of time see how that see if that feels for you if you if you can feel yourself sliding back into relapse you may want to strongly consider the decision to fast and we have uh one last comment is there any center to volunteer for such training and workshops um 
I'm assuming in, in, in disordered eating in East Lansing. I don't know if you're from Michigan, Sister Anissa, but the question seems to be for Michigan. I'm not from Michigan, but I'm aware of a lot of resources there. Um, I'm not really familiar with like an eating disorder training per se. I mean, there are trainings on, um, there are trainings like men, most not, well, there are now Muslim mental health first aid trainings, which is very exciting to see that. Um, but, and I'm pretty sure that in Michigan, there are some of those um, that take place every once in a while. I think Khalil Center um, is the one that they organize that a lot of times in different states. So it just depends. You can contact them and see what would be available with regard to that training in Michigan. But there are um, mental health first aid trainings. There are suicide prevention, safe talk trainings. Um, Khalil Center is not in East Lansing. They're based out of Chicago, but they have a directory of resources in different states throughout the US, so they would be a good contact for that. Um, but yeah, I, there are other trainings, They and the mental health first aid training does have a component to it that's eating disorder related, but I'm not familiar with one that's just specific to eating disorders. It would be great if there was, honestly, but you can also check out the um, National Eating Disorder Association website and see what they have on there with their trainings, inshallah. I think that's it for our questions and we're right on time. Thank you so much, Sister Anissa. This, this was so necessary. Uh, we got so much feedback on um, just putting up the flyer for this event and presenting it to the community. People were so excited that we were finally gonna address this topic. We're so grateful for you to you for doing it uh, so well. Um, you guys can connect with Sister Anissa Diab at www.anissadiab.com. She has a link there where you can send her a, uh, a direct email. And um, that's the end of our event. I just want to mention one more time that Mojibon Initiative has a suggested donation of $5 per person for today's event. Donations allow us to continue providing quality programming all throughout this month of Ramadan in 2022, but also all year long. You can send your donations to me via Venmo at hedia-javahibis and the last four numbers of my phone number are in the chat in case Venmo asks you for it. Thank you guys so much for coming and that's the end of our program for tonight. Inshallah, everybody's fast is accepted tonight. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone.